This morning we're going to be talking about activist learning in the digital classroom. We have three presenters. So to my immediate right, we have Dr. Kelly coogan Gare, who is, again, a Rutgers alum, but also um, educator for the Institute for Health and Socioeconomic Policy of the National Nurses United. Uh, she got her BA from Duke and her PhD from our department. Um, her scholarly publications complicate existing histories of academic feminism and women's studies by developing alternative accounts of feminist field formation. For her scholarship, Coogan Gare was named an exemplary diversity scholar by the National Center for Institutional Diversity. She currently teaches continuing education classes for nurses on the relationship among the environment, health, and the economy, and on the relationship between nursing and the global economy. And she has also taught feminist pedagogies, feminist theories and methodo methodologies, and critical race feminisms at Rutgers at Eastern Wash and Eastern Washington University, where she was awarded the Jeffers Chertok Dean's Faculty Award for Outstanding Teaching and Mentorship two years in a row. To her right, we have Heidi Haste. Christy, I'm sorry. Christy, Christy, I'm sorry. Christy, no I'm problem. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure I get phone sorry. No problem. Okay. So, <laughs> Dr. Masatsos is an educator as well for the Institute for Health and Socioeconomic Policy of the National Nurses United. She received her PhD from the University of California, Irvine, in social science with an emphasis in women's studies um, and wrote a dissertation on transnational beauty culture and local bodies, an ethnographic account of consumption and identity in urban Greece, which received the best dissertation award by the Modern Greek Studies Association in 2003. She was also a visiting research fellow at the Seeger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton, and her publications offer a critical examination of the ways that neoliberal globalization shapes gender subjectivity in the context of print advertisements, direct marketing, and consumption in the U.S. Uh, and the European Union. And she has broad research interests in women's health and the relationships among gender, labor, health, and globalization. She has over 20 years of experience teaching courses in gender and sexuality studies, anthropology, sociology, and cultural studies at small and large institutions such as Irvine, Scripps College, and Iowa State. And finally, we have Heidi Pease. Is that right? Sure. It's Hicks. 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 That's all right. Hicks. Okay. <laughs> I want to make sure I say it correctly. All right. Oops. So, our um, screen just went out for the tech folks. Is it idle? Oh, yeah, that's it. Oh, sorry, okay. <laughs> um, no problem. Dr. Hicks yes. is an educator <laughs> at the Institute for Health and Socioeconomic Policy of the National Nurses United as well. She has a BA in Women's Studies in English from University of Minnesota Morris, um, and an MA in Literatures in English. Uh, her, liter her MA and PhD are from Literatures in English uh, and U.S. Cultural Studies from the University of California, San Diego. She has, uh, her research is focused on cumulative racializing impacts of speculative bubbles and panics from 19th century indigenous land and slave markets uh, through the 21st century housing crisis. Hext has taught in women's and gender, feminist, sexuality, critical race, critical legal, cultural, and American studies. Wow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they're all very close to my heart, so I think it's awesome. Uh, as well as English and Literature for National Nurses United. Uh, Tulane University, UC Santa Barbara, Cornell, Auburn State Correctional Facility, uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, and UC San Diego. And she has been recognized as an outstanding faculty member, exemplary National Diversity Scholar, and Mellon Postdoctoral Fellow. Her soul as an activist intellectual has been sustained by the creativity and critical thinking of students, activists, and workers who collaborate in her classes from widely diverse backgrounds, locations, and learning experiences to challenge systemic inequality and injustice. Without further ado. <laughs> so just so you know, the URL for this is womensglobalhealthleadership.org. No spaces, no dashes, no apostrophe. Just get my presentation up here. Is my head in the way? No. I was preparing for this presentation at the same time that I was preparing my syllabus for gendered professions in the transnational care economy. 
The course that I'm currently teaching in our certificate program in women's global health leadership. I couldn't help but note a certain irony. My course <coughs> assesses core beliefs about the profession of nursing that the political organization for which I work subscribes. Beliefs that are, in some senses, inconsistent with embarking on an online educational enterprise. Chrissy, Heidi, and I, as you just heard, are political educators for the Institute for Health and Socioeconomic Policy, which is the research arm of National Nurses United. We are the largest uh, nursing organization in the country with over 300,000 nurses. Um, we are now larger than the American Nursing Association. And basically, we broke off from the American Nursing Association, and we represent the interests of bedside nurses, whereas the American Nursing Association represents the interests of management. So from here on out, just to make things shorter, I'm going to refer to National Nurses United just as NNU. Our organization builds its politics on the belief that nursing, much like teaching, is a highly personalized labor of care driven by human need rather than by profit and involving work that in many cases requires intensive physical labor, direct person-to-person -person communication, and spatial proximity. Nursing and teaching focus on the cultivation and preservation of human capacities and thus, to some extent, resist digitization, routinization, and automation, which have the potential sometimes to squeeze out genuine skill, creativity, spontaneity, ingenuity, and human connection, as much as they have the potential to enhance it. And there I was preparing for an online course that interrogates the dehumanizing tendencies of technological pro progress for nursing and teaching. And yet here we are at an online uh, feminist pedagogies conference, invited because we have collaborated with the extremely gracious Women's and Gender Studies Department at Rutgers to create this entirely online certificate program. But is this master's tools dismantling the master's box tension not foundational to feminist field formation, pedagogically, methodologically, and epistemologically? In our case, the master's tools are technologies somewhat complicit in the corporatization of the university. Technology is partly responsible for a decrease in university professors. Technologies that incontrovertibly result from severe budget cuts in higher education. In this conception, the online classroom <coughs> can serve as a band-aid for the gaping wound to which neoliberal capitalism has subjected all levels of public education. Yet, the technology of the online classroom has made it possible for us to educate and build activist intellectual networks and relationships with nurses hundreds and sometimes thousands of miles away, and nurses who are in other countries. Without this extra-dimensional time and space of the online classroom, these newfound connections across geographical and cultural di distances would not be possible. Our panel today introduces the new set of voices, the new intelligibilities, the new political possibilities, and the new relationships the online classroom facilitates. In a strange way, the online classroom enables us to teach a critique of the very neoliberal social and economic structures that brought it into being. Our goal here today is, in part, to discuss how we can best wrest the online classroom from these neoliberal forces and use it for the intricate and historically specific task of 21st century feminist movement building. My presentation will provide a brief overview of our organization, because I think that many of you, you might have heard of us since, uh, since our collaboration, but you might not know of uh, what we do, and why we sought out the online classroom as a primary platform for our political education and for our advocacy and activism. Chrissy and Heidi are gonna talk more specifically in their presentations about their classes and how those classes facilitate, facilitated activist intellectual engagement among the students and the nurses. The movement building politics of NNU are based in something I call the nurse's standpoint. Of course, I borrow the concept 
of the nurse's standpoint from the socialist feminist genealogy of Hartsock, Kathy Weeks, Harding, and my most favorite, Patricia Hill Collins. Standpoint theory maintains that the labor we do on a daily basis in tandem with our positionality has consequences for our ontology or who we are and our epistemology, or how we think and know as we navigate this world. These ontological and epistemological consequences of laboring practices and, and positionality have the potential to create a chain of critical levers that can inspire loyalty or disobedience to the existing dominant social and economic arrangements. As political educators at NNU, our role is to educate nurses into a collective disobe disobedience that inspires them to question and resist to some extent their employers and the hospital industry, as well as the larger social and economic relationships that align the priorities of hospital corporations with global capitalism and profit. We perform this education primarily through our continuing education courses. Nurses have to take um, 30 continuing, edu continuing education credits every two years. Mm -hmm. We teach anything from um, the role of nursing and nurse migration in the global economy and global health disparities to the impacts of environmental racism, classism, and climate change on health to the effects of healthcare restructuring with uh, the uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on people's ability to access the health care they so desperately need but cannot necessarily afford. By virtue of what they do for a living, nurses have a very unique glimpse into how neoliberal economic policy and ideology impact people at their most vulnerable, undignified, and human of states, that of illness. The clip that I'm about to play specifies the types of things that nurses see in their patients <coughs> since the economic collapse in 2008. Essentially, the clip elaborates what I'm calling the nurse's standpoint. So obviously from this clip, nurses know that good health for their patients, just as we know, cannot be achieved by viewing health in strictly physiological terms. So one of the most significant accomplishments of the nurse's standpoint is that it extends the definition of health to include factors that preclude access to necessary health care. So drawing from the standpoint of nurses, NNU creates a politics of linkage that gives larger social, social, economic, and political meaning and context to what nurses see in their patients, clinics, hospitals, and the failed American and global health system on a daily basis. So nurses are linking, and we're trying to do this in the certificate program as well, the health of their patients to social spending on education, social programs, sufficient earning power to avoid deprivation of food, nutrition, and shelter, and respect for economic, political, and civil rights. And this is the politics of linkage that founded our desire to collaborate with Women's and Gender Studies at Rutgers to create this online program. So I want to, I want to share some very quick but powerful visual examples, pictures. Um, of our activism and politics. They are not in chronological order. If anything, I'm kind of like moving backwards from the present to the past. Um, and then this is going to lead me very quickly into um, why we wanted to collaborate uh, with Rutgers for a certificate program in women's global health leadership. So this first picture here, um, most of you know about Typhoon Haiyin. Um, we sent uh, several hundred of our nurses to the Philippines to do uh, disaster relief efforts in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyin. Um, some of you may know this already. We deployed hundreds of nurses to New York City and New Jersey after um, Hurricane Sandy. Um, and we sent several thousand nurses, actually, to Haiti after the earthquake, um, and then to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. On August 24th, we organized a very large contingent of nurses to participate in the Reclaim the Dream March in Washington, DC. Um, I know most of you probably heard of the Occupy because you were uh, in the center of it. Um, in every single uh, major metropolitan Occupy, um, we set up a medical tent. And these medical tents had several hundred people a day who did not have access to health care showing up and getting health care from our nurses in these medical tents. It was actually quite moving. So this is our medical tent in, um, in Occupy Oakland. Um, this is Martise. Um, she is one of our nurses in Chicago. 
And she and this next nurse I'm going to show you, um, the Chicago police, of course, um, threatened to dismantle our um, medical tent. And Martise, and I'm going to show you um, this picture of Jan next, uh, and Jan just stood in front of the medical tent, um, arms locked, and of course got arrested. And so this is after they were released from prison, and um, she's getting interviewed, and then Jan's getting interviewed. Um, this is our uh, executive director, Roseanne DeMoral, on the Tavis Smiley Show. I just had to put this in here because she's sitting next to New New <laughs> <laughs> um, And the theme of the show is Poverty Must End, and she's there to talk about something I'm going to talk just a second about in a bit, called a financial transaction <coughs> tax, and how that would be used to put money into social programs. Um, we are fighting across the country for something called a Patient Protection Act, um, this is to institute national nurse to patient ratios. In the state of California, it's about one nurse to every four patients. It is state legislation. We want to make this national law to protect patients so that you don't have nurses doing like 10, 12 patients on a shift and being overworked and overexhausted. And this isn't just about the nurses. This is about protecting the patients as well. Um, we're also going around the country community organizing reminding people that the, the Obamacare or Affordable Care Act has been shortened to the ACA when it's really the pro Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And so we're reminding people that it in fact includes patient protection in the legislation. So this is part of that. Um, we went around California and some other states with a Medicare for All or single payer health system bus tour. Um, basically, we held town hall meetings to discuss the possibility of what a single-payer healthcare system would look like in the United States. Um, just one really moving story. Um, one very poor woman showed up to um, this, a town hall meeting that we held and said that just a few months ago she had had a heart attack and her, teen, her teenage son was with her. And um, she had the heart attack and her teenage son went to dial 911 and she says, please don't call them because if you call them, we're going to go bankrupt because they're going to come and they're going to charge us several hundred thousand dollars. I would just rather die. Mm -hmm. And so she came and she shared this and of course he called and you know, she's in huge, she was in medical bankruptcy and this is why she came in the meeting. But this is just like one example of, of the type of um, awareness that we try to raise. And also, um, you heard in that brief clip our executive director talk about something called the Tell Us Where It Hurts campaign. Um, this is a digital campaign for us. We actually go around interviewing disadvantaged folks, people who have um, restricted access to health care, asking them to come out of their silence and talk about how it is that their economic disadvantage or uh, racial disadvantage um, being placed in an environmentally compromised area, how those disadvantages are precluding their access to, to health and necessary health care, just to break their silence, essentially. Um, we had, this is in New York, this is why I, I included this, um, the service Wall Street uh, protests. Um, this is us organizing a particular uh, hospital system in New York. Most of you know that the um, service is the three-headed dog of Greek and Roman mythology. I just wanted to kind of show you the theatrical things that we try to do with our politics um, when we're on the picket line. Uh, our most recent thing has been to fight climate change. I'm actually heavily involved in community organizing around environmental racism and classism at the moment with the nurses, and actually training the nurses to go out and organize their communities. Um, since our nurses are, have been so involved in disaster relief efforts, they are beginning to recognize that climate change has considerable implications for environmental racism and classism because it's the racially and economically disadvantaged groups that are obviously going to be disproportionately impacted by natural disaster, right? So um, we recently established Global Nurses United. Um, where, and I'm going to just click again, this is a picture of all the different leaders um, who are part of our Global Nurses United. And then they, these are the, the, our sister nurses, nursing unions. Um, and the organization, uh, it's sort of like a federation of union, was formed to fight against the harmful effects of austerity measures globally, privatization, and cuts in healthcare services that put both people and communities at risk. We had a global day of action last September 17th. This is our American nurses in New York City. Um, this is nurse, our nursing, sister nursing union in South Korea, um, Dominican Republic, Canada, the Philippines, and Australia. 
Um, again, I just wanted to show you our theatrics um, mm -hmm. uh, as activism. Uh, May 18th of 2012, thousands of, thousands of nurses and other protesters marched two miles um, through the streets of downtown Chicago and descended on Chicago's Daly Plaza. Um, and this was our reconstructed site of Camp David. Um, some of you may know that this was supposed to be the site of the G8 summit. They were so intimidated, the world leaders were so intimidated by our planned protest um, because we had told them to expect about 5,000 people. Um, that they moved it from from Chicago to Camp David. So then we decided that we were going to make fun of them. Um, so this is us making fun of. That's Angela Merkel. You can see there. <laughs> Fake Angela Merkel. Um, so this we also called on world leaders to adopt a national and international financial transaction tax. We changed the name of the financial transaction tax because our nurses were having a difficult time sort of understanding what it is. It's basically a tax on Wall Street speculation, on, on derivatives, and we estimate that it would raise about $350 billion a year that could be used to, to put money into social programs. Well, we changed it, and I know women's studies folks aren't going to like this too much, but you've got to appreciate the gender bending of this photo. We changed it to the Robin Hood tax, um, to, so that our nurses, the, the denotation to the Robin Hood tax, so that our nurses could sort of conceptually grasp that this was about, you know, taking money from the most economically powerful, the 1% of the 1%, and bringing it down to, 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 um, to communities that, that really actually need it. The problem is is that many of our nurses don't understand it's not really just about taxing the rich, it's about it's about taxing these derivatives, it's about taxing Wall Street, it's about it's a it's, a, it's what we call a non-reformist reform. We're trying to get into the rifts and cracks of, of, of Wall Street gambling and speculation mm -hmm. and bring that money back to the people because of course we're the ones being blamed, right, for the financial fallout. It's our fault that we overspent and it's our fault that we're foreclosing, and we're saying, no, it's not the people's fault. It's, it's the people at the very top. Um, in November 2011, this is just one photo. Our nurse leaders attended the G20 protests in France, and this was a part of um, beginning to organize for Global Nurses United. And it, this is important, because it was after this summit that our education program began thinking about ways to creatively fill a knowledge void for our nurses. And that's why we came to Rutgers. At this summit, our nurses were not fully prepared to address the global implications of calling for a financial transaction tax. Mm -hmm. What our nurses learned, and this is unsurprising to you, is that countries in the global south were hesitant to back national financial transaction taxes or financial tra transaction taxes at the individual country level without a global FTT without a staunch commitment from the global north to funnel, lar funnel large portions of that revenue with no strings attached into the global south. The governments of many third world countries maintained that a global redistribution of resources needed to take place before most third world countries would be in a position to redistribute resources internally through a national financial transaction tax. So the point is, for the first time, some of our nurses had to reconcile a very harsh reality. Mm. Newfound knowledge of the disproportionate economic advantage global capitalism gives to countries in the global north. Many of them consist consciously, for the first time, faced imperialism of global capitalism at these G20 protests. They had to reconcile this newfound awareness of imperialism with their own experiential knowledge of the deep economic, social, and political inequalities in our own country, the third world in the West, as, as, as Mohanty calls it. But they lacked the appropriate conceptual tools for this reconciliation, which marked, really, their irreversible transition from political actors on a national stage to political actors on a global stage. So, and this is just a list of our courses. It's going to move up. You'll see it in just a second. With the help of Women's and Gender Studies, we designed the certificate program in Women's Global Health Leadership to educate nurses to develop a critique of imperialism by grounding it in something many of them have expertise and political and intellectual interest in, which is global health, of course. So our aim in working with Women's and Gender Studies Department at Rutgers is to continue building the online certificate program is not simply to enhance the political and conceptual field of potential for our nurses. We hope that Rutgers students 
with intellectual, emotional, and political investments in social justice knowledge projects, see how our nurses use feminist theory and scholarship to devise political tactics, strategies, and a vision for change within their hospital facilities and within society at large. The single most important thing that I have learned since leaving an academic position for an activist one is that the theory praxis split Yes, that pesky split. We wasted hours, no, I shouldn't say wasted. We spent hours fighting about in graduate seminars wherein those on the side of praxis were in the moral ontological right, and those on the side of theory were in the epistemological right. It is a discursive fiction. Of course, this is in itself the subject of a totally different talk. But in, in ways that are not always predictable, and certainly in ways that will break our preconceived notions for how theory should be used to imagine and do activism. Mm -hmm. Nurses take what they learn in these online classes and grow the scale of their patient advocacy beyond the bed bedside, beyond anything they've ever imagined for themselves at the start of their career. And yet they usually come out of the class saying that it reconnected them to why they went into nursing in the first place. Thank you again for inviting us to participate and share our experience. Um, I'm Chrissy Mutatos, and as Kelly said, this past semester, I was one of the educators who taught for the uh, online certificate program. And the course that I taught was Global Women's Health Movement, um, which is one of the core courses for the certificate program. Um, as a feminist scholar uh, who has taught for over 20 years now, I have always strived to teach uh, all my courses, whether they're women's studies or not, by adhering to a feminist pedagogy. And for me, this has entailed a classroom experience that is not just about mastering the uh, assigned content, but one where students develop critical thinking skills and a voice to elaborate on their experiences with uh, social inequality and to learn from one another's uh, standpoint. Now, uh, all of the years that I have been teaching has been in face-to-face -face, uh, classrooms. And this has been, um, in a, uh, I have taught a variety of courses in a variety of um, uh, departments. This was the very first time I was teaching an online uh, course. And from the moment I started conceptualizing how I was going about uh, to do, how I was going to uh, go about teaching this course, I was concerned about what the impact of the disembodied classroom would have on my ability to achieve two things. The first one was to develop and teach a course that adheres to feminist pedagogical principles. And second, how I was going to keep the students motivated to read and engage with the assigned materials and become inspired to further engage in activism. So before I go any further, I need to give you a little bit of sense of this course. This was taught um, on the platform for online teaching offered by Sakai. And I also had the assistance, uh, a teaching assistant, uh, which was Nafisa Tanji, who's in the back of the room. Uh, 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 very, very capable Nafisa. She's a graduate student here at Rutgers. So in this course, we examine the current health issues faced by women all over the world and the various strategies employed by global women's health movements to respond to the social, economic, and political governance structures responsible for health and justice globally. Some of the topics we examine include an analysis of the global institutions and policies that impact health globally and how these shape women's health experience at the local level. We also examine the relationships between health, poverty, race, class, sex politics, neoliberalism, and globalization. We examine the ideological debates shaping the efforts of grassroots organizations and NGOs working to improve women's health experiences. In addition to several articles that I assigned, the students also had to read um, Janine Flavin's book, Our Bodies Are Crimes, 
Anne Frith Murray's book, From Outrage to Courage, Women Taking Action for Health and Justice. Ida Susher's book, AIDS, Sex, and Culture, Global Politics and Survival in Southern Africa. Miriam Stickton's book, Casualties of Care, Immigration and the Politics of Humanitarianism in France. And Meredith Tertian's book, Women's Health Movements, A Global Force for Change. The class was attended by 50 students, three of which were men. Um, one of them was, was uh, located in Haiti. One student was in San Francisco. One was located in Los Angeles. And all the rest were in uh, the East Coast. Um, in terms of assignments, the students had to uh, provide the, they had to submit weekly online discussions and worksheets. These were worth 40% of their final grade. They had to uh, produce two class projects that, uh, whose topic was on women's acti uh, activism and health movements. That was also worth 40% of their grade. And they also had one final, which was 20% of the grade. So as you see here, um, the majority of the grade was uh, participatory, was, uh, was going to come through their participation in the class. So in my experience, and for most of my women's studies classes, it takes at least a semester in an embodied classroom with frequent and constant interaction between the students with one another and me to slowly move away from being strangers who do not know each other, nor necessarily trust each other, to becoming a feminist learning community who cares about uh, collective political aspirations and also collective, women, uh, collective women's struggles. So in the embodied classroom, my goal has always, been to, has always been to bring the material alive. And in order to do that, I would, of course, um, engage in the performativity of teaching. So all of you here who walk into the classroom know very well what that means. You speak loudly. You move your hands. You convey the affect the material has on you um, through the material. You move around the room. You write on the board. Or you pass out handouts with study questions. Or you implement various activities. The physicality and embodiment of the students also fuel how the classroom time goes on. So in my case, um, I was able to read or feel how things were going by just looking at the students, reading their body language. Um, I knew that if they were looking at me, laughing at my jokes, or they were staying awake, then I was doing a good job. <laughs> and, uh, or the material was interesting, and it was, you know, um, arousing them and keeping them um, awake and so on. Uh, if they were yawning or spending too much time on Facebook, <laughs> then it was a signal for me to put them into groups or to get them to write up on the board uh, and to try to get them to wake up and pay attention. If I saw horror on their faces, I knew that I was pushing their buttons, or that I was being controversial, and that I was on the right track or not. Through also their participation in classroom activities, I would get a sense of how well they were reading and understanding the material, and then I would be able to adjust things accordingly, and moreover, encourage them to learn from one another. So the classroom, as a physical and embodied space, has been key all these years in my ability to be a good teacher um, and um, relate to the students. So how is all of this going to work out online? So to my surprise, nevertheless, the embodiment of online teaching, the disembodiment of online teaching, I can say that by the end of the semester in global women's health movement, Nafisa and I were successful uh, we successfully moved the students from being total strangers to a feminist learning community of potential activists who related and cheered on each other. So I am going to share with you some examples of how this transpired and what came of, uh, of it. 
So right here, there's an example of um, online exchange between our nurses. In one posting, our nurse Jennifer Gentwad, um, a registered nurse uh, double majoring in psychology and nursing, conveyed what happened to her during an attempt to bring the course content to her family during Thanksgiving holiday. She wrote, Thanksgiving is a great testing ground for what we've been learning. My sister-in-law just asked me what I'm studying in school. I actually told her all about the class. After about two to three minutes explanation, I said, I know that's not polite party talk, but that's what I'm studying. She was actually appreciative that I had explained concepts to her such as neoliberal globalization and the effects on women, children, and the poor. Maybe I underestimate the compassion of people. Based on this sample of one person, I feel more confident about talking to others about these topics. Now, Ashley Fowles, a registered labor and delivery nurse and doula, who um, is also uh, one of our nurses, and she also took Heidi's class and my class. She responded to Amy's posting by describing her efforts to do the same among her co-workers at the hospital. So she responded to Jennifer. I have been working a lot of night shifts over the past few weeks and on a slow evening recently. I fired up my laptop to watch a few of the course's required videos. At one point, while watching the Foxconn and Santa's workshops videos, a cohort asked if she could sit in and watch as well. Before too long, a little group was gathered and everybody's eyes were wide. People were shocked to learn about the horrifying truth regarding living and working conditions around the globe. After the films, I was able to talk further about the class, and as you encountered, people were very eager to be enlightened. If even just your sister-in-law and few co-workers are inspired through what we have learned, then change is already happening. Even subtle change for justice is better than no change. So here are two nurses thinking across the same lines, eager to take on activist lessons further from the classroom to um, people around them and to their community, which I think is pretty significant. Now, another example of how the, cur uh, the course added um, oomph, at least, to say oomph, to another nurse activist efforts in the, is in the case of Amy Cyrus. Amy is one of our nurses who has been living and working in Haiti for the last four years. There with her partner, she runs a nonprofit grassroots organization called Second Mile Haiti. This organization provides free supplements to uh, poor mothers with undernourished babies. It also provides early detection of HIV for infants and works in helping these mothers find sustainable ways to uh, support their families in the long run. While checking with her to see if she was having any problems logging into Sakai from Haiti, she wrote this email. Chrissy, thank you so much for checking in and for your kind words. It is working out very well for me to do the course from Haiti outside, uh, and outside uh, from a few films that won't stream outside the US and wishing I had more time, as you said, but so far, so good. I am getting a lot out of this course. Just this week, I was working on a grant proposal for our organization, and I felt so much better prepared to write the problem sections after all we have discussed in the course with regards to women and health. Know that I appreciate this opportunity on behalf of NNU and all the time you put into bringing these issues to light. All is well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So here we have a, a nurse that is in the trenches doing activist work, using the materials from the online course to write a proposal that will bring in money for her to continue doing what she's doing. So the question then is, how did we overcome the limitations of the disembodied online course and brought feminist pedagogy to the online environment? So in my evaluation of the course, I will highlight four of the tools that uh, we use to enable this. So the virtual lounge is a forum. I set it up in the very beginning of the semester. And the students went on 
introduced themselves. They also posted pictures of themselves and they wrote out what their aspirations are, what they hope to get out of the course, who they are, what are their hobbies. Some of them posted, as I said, pictures. And this was a place where over the semester, all the class could go back to and refresh themselves. Who is this person who's answering to me? What, um, what else can I know about them? And from the very first week when this established, uh, students already started connecting to uh, one another. The second uh, tool that I use that was also, it's also on Sakai, and it's a really good feature, I found is the add comment. The add comment was added to every week of the, of the course. And this is a tool that enables the students to upload any kind of material they feel connects back to the course. So it could be videos, it could be lectures, it could be uh, internet uh, blogs, it could be anything you can imagine. Um, and students really took to this very much. So in this sense, they were also contributing to the course content. Uh, one student in particular, particularly that was Jennifer, uh, that I just mentioned previously, she uploaded about 15 different kinds of articles that she found on the internet for the other students to read and add to the course. So this was a way of the students to have some control over the content. So now um, are the weekly worksheets. This was uh, mandatory every week. Um, there were 14 weeks in the semester. They had to upload 10 of these. These worksheets were uh, w the primary way in which I got a sense of what the students understood from the readings, whether they were doing the readings, how much they understood, what it, and what it was that they did not understand, so then I could go back and clarify. And this worked really, really well um, in the sense that it, it gave me point, you know, class to class, lecture to lecture, and uh, a feel of what was going on uh, with them. Students liked this so much that they told me they were going to use it in their other classes. And so this was a really, really uh, powerful tool for them. And um, I'm continuing to use this um, this semester, of course. And finally, it was the online discussion. Now, this was where the course came alive. Um, when I was teaching face-to-face, -face, I always tried to find ways to engage all students in class discussion. While mostly successful, there will always be a struggle to get the quiet students to speak out and get the very vocal students to not speak so much. <laughs> so on the online course, this was not the case. Because it was so uh, such a big part of their grade and they had to post twice a week at least, everybody had to do it. But it wasn't like pulling teeth. All the students participate in this with great enthusiasm is what I found. And not everything that was posted all the time was profound and uh, mind shattering, but I found that students did engage with each other's ideas and their take on the material and did this much more than in the face-to-face -face classroom. So this was the big surprise for me. Now, um, what also happened here is because the discussion was so central to the interaction between the students, my, uh, my voice, uh, my authoritative voice as a professor took a back seat to that of the students. So I was not so central anymore. And this was great. <laughs> this was wonderful. Um, and it was a nice change of pace in terms of the students learning from each other much more than in the embodied uh, classroom and also um, uh, improving their writing skills which was really important and their critical thinking skills because before you sit down and write a response you really have to think about what is it that you're going to say instead of just spewing out things on the fly which a lot of our students do when they haven't read anything and they're just trying to impress us. So um, <laughs> the disembodiment enabled the students, of, uh, the voices of the students to take central stage. And I will keep teaching the certificate program 
using these tools and further trying to improve on solidifying my pedagogical goals. So one of, uh, one of the things I want to improve is how to get the students to, uh, collab uh, to contribute to the structuring of the course more and more beyond the ad comment. So this is something that I'm working on now. And also, I'm open to suggestions from others here that have taught these online classes and have thought along the same lines, is please give me feedback on what you have done and what you think would work. So that is all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the patient thank Food and embodiment is really important, even when we're working in digitized formats. And we still have bodies someplace, right? Um, so much like Kelly's, my reflections today relate to living in the contradictions of advanced neoliberal capitalism. I've experienced online teaching as an example of how the tools and technologies that capital deploys to make educational labor flexible, redundant, precarious, and uncritical can become powerful resources for creatively responding to and building alternatives against the constraints of systemic repression. I'm so delighted that Mary and Brittany um, have created the opportunity for us to be here today, and I'm honored that we are able to think together about some of the educational models and possibilities that we are only just beginning to imagine <clears throat> and build for our joint program together. So I'm going to use my time on this panel to carry you through a journey in feminist pedagogy, which begins with my experience of experiences between 2005 and 2013, teaching in tension with the field of women's studies intergenerational divisions in face-to-face -face feminist classrooms. And this journey ends with the course I taught last semester entitled Impacts to Economic Inequality on Women's Health um, for the online certificate program. Specifically, I will highlight how the digital format of this course eradicated generational division in many respects by making cross-generational coalitions necessary. My brief story about digital feminist pedagogy leans toward the unlikely collaborations, cross-experiential knowledge formations, and unleashed coalitional possibilities that emerge when students from widely diverse backgrounds and intellectual trajectories come to depend on one another in order to advance shared political goals. Against all expectation, translating feminist pedagogy to the online classroom has provided me with an incredible and humbling privilege to teach from the delightful shock of impossibility. In the so-assumed real time and real space of the traditional university classrooms where I've taught introductory theory, methods, and various feminist topics courses, generational division has presented both a point of departure for epistemological interrogation and a material condition of my day-to-day -day instructional operations. From the vantage of the face-to-face -face teaching I performed at Tulane, UC Santa Barbara, and Cornell, impossibility presented itself as the miracle of force and uninterrogated frustration that led a fairly homogenous body of young 20-something, mostly women, into my classrooms. For nearly a decade, I stood in front of a generation of so-assumed traditional undergraduate students whose subjection to a culture of neoliberal individuation left them not only with a misrepresented understanding of feminist politics, but that had also severed many of them from memories and ties to complex histories of local, national, and global feminist struggles. In the historical context of post-feminist backlash and anti-intellectualism, the daily ch challenge was often how to retain the liminal and shrinking institutional <coughs> spaces where this generation of pre-emergent feminist thinkers could develop an analysis of how neoliberalism undermines feminism. This left little room for students to think across generational divisions and differences. Institutionally, my personal effort to negotiate the ways that disciplinary retrenchment in the face of so-called economic crisis uneasily corroborated with academic concerns about the ways that interdisciplinary social justice-oriented programs and, and departments had been institutionalized pushed me over the edge of what Wendy Brown named <laughs> The material conditions under which I taught are part of the story behind why I found it necessary to leave traditional university teaching in order to remain a feminist pedagogue. As one or two younger, I use that in scare quotes now because I'm feeling a bit older, um, visiting <laughs> postdoctoral professors who did the bulk of the teaching in each of the programs I passed through, my capacities to participate in intergenerational feminist movement building was severely limited. 
generational laments and the gatekeeping side effects of them related to political, intellectual, structural divisions within feminist studies added to my sense that the current state of universities made intergenerational feminism in this domain highly unlikely. I experienced debates in the field as inextricable from my material concerns about university restructuring. Technology at, at this impasse signified for me an assault on rigorous critical teachings, a, a dangerous administrative vehicle for replacing tenured lines with flexible adjuncts, mm -hmm. and a capitalist ploy to replace semi-stable teaching positions with non-unionized, underpaid, and under-resourced intellectuals. My life now as an activist intellectual on the periphery of academia comes with its own set of contradictions. <laughs> like my former students, most of my current students are women. Yet, unlike the fairly age, economic, and even racial homogeneity of the students I taught in face-to-face -face classrooms, the nurses that I teach, both through the certificate program and in our continuing education program, range in age. They are racially, culturally, and nationally diverse, and they economically arrive to nursing from a broad range of social classes. They are members of a union, of course, um, which in effect mitigates some of, some of this class division. Given my excitement about teaching across differences in my current position, I did not expect to encounter another, albeit differently constituted, generational divide. In the healthcare version of material restructuring, technology is the culprit driving intergenerational tension. For the past two decades, healthcare workers have been faced with a gradual movement within the industry to de-skill, dismantle, and devalue professional nursing. The gradual and now pervasive introduction of more technology at the bedside has been used systematically within the industry as an excuse for replacing experienced and licensed nurses with lesser skilled medical assistants and technicians. Younger nurses with less experience at the bedside are trained to use computer diagnostics, protocols, and electronic health records programs as a central component of their RN education. When they enter the profession, they are often promoted as super users of healthcare's new technological infrastructure and charged as supervisors and authorities over nurses with much more bedside, hands-on experience. The healthcare industry's strategic production of technological division pits nurses from different generations against one another, creating intergenerational conflicts that can distract nurses from asking questions about how technology often detrimentally impacts their relationships to their colleagues as well as with their patients. Online teaching in our joint certificate program in global women's health leadership has created right opportunities and platforms for thinking and acting beyond the logics of generational division in both the academic and technological sense. By way of example, I will discuss how the impossibility of intergenerational solidarity became possible and necessary in my course last semester. First, the digital platform changed the composition of who could be included in the virtual room. Some of my students were traditional Rutgers undergraduates, some were non-traditional Rutgers students with full-time jobs and full-time life, responsi life responsibilities beyond those of a typical undergrad. Because conducting classes in real time makes it impossible for many nurses with erratic shifts to engage in extended study, the asyn asynchronicity of digital message boards makes it possible for students to participate in their own time. Geographically, this also enabled students here in New Jersey to learn in collaboration with students who enrolled in the course from across California, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and other locations. My students ranged in their life trajectories from traditional undergrads to RNs who had recently entered the workforce, um, others with more experience, and at least one semi-retired grandmother. I've not seen many of them in person, but the stories and experiences they discussed over the course of 14 weeks revealed that our knowledge community included immigrants from many parts of the globe and U.S. Na nationals from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds. Secondly, the hybridity of who was in the room no doubt influenced how students discussed and engaged coursework and materials. A major bridge of generational differences, however, seemed to be related less to where students were located in real time and space um, and within social systems than how and where they were positioned in their real-time academic and prof professional lives, as either identifying primarily as students or primarily as other, uh, nurses or other professionals. These different pr primary status identifications introduced a mixed bag of reading strategies into our shared conversations. In discussion forums, I tasked students with honing their skills and capacities for critical analysis with forum questions that asked them to demonstrate post-textual analysis, something akin to what Chrissy's done here. Um, However, during the latter half of each week, 
I encourage them to engage in open discussions through a combination of their own prompts and prompts that I, I guided them through. The general course purpose of, of bridging our understanding of human health with our critical understanding of social and economic systems lent itself to fruitful interdisciplinary engagement. Students with predominant footing in the university engaged materials from the disciplinary perspectives of sociology, history, cultural analysis, public health, and policy. Like their professor, they often began their thinking about health and inequality from broad structural, historical, and theoretical lenses. Many nurses, however, first approached course materials with focus on health indicators and the science of human embodiment. These different points of conversational entry helped to shape a critical climate of shared learning because it became obvious very early on that each student in the class came to the forums with a different set of understandings and experiences. Thus, the ways that age and experience often manifest in disciplinary face-to-face -face classrooms as a trump card of expertise was lost to a climate in which students quickly discovered that nobody in the room was an expert in everything. <laughs> My pedagogical choice to include both generally accessible text, media clips, and movement histories alongside quite difficult and dense theoretical materials also fostered intergenerational interdependence. The course was difficult on two registers. It required students to work through sophisticated intellectual challenges and also required them to work through the harsh realities of human injustice that differentially com compromise women's health. The two-pronged necessity of working through seems to have organically created a need for collaboration through which students came to regard one another as inter-experienced guides and resources for making sense of complex lived and theoretical problems. They counted on one another to explain and make sense of economic issues that were unfamiliar to most at the beginning of the semester. And they counted on one another to ethically deal with the human suffering on a global scale that they were watching and experiencing and witnessing. Many forum conversations thus resonated as a type of feminist practice in which the dual tasks of developing a shared analysis and building an ethical and just response created a context for students to generatively move through and even learn from their generational, geographic, and other differences. In this regard, third point here, the digital format is conducive to feminist movement making because it gives students tools to organize their thinking around a shared purpose. Despite some reservations, I experimented with group projects as a culminating class exercise. In this final project, students were required to investigate further one health risk um, or concern that we had studied and come up with, uh, uh, that we'd studied over the course of the semester, and they were tasked to come up with a um, social and economic response for treating the underlying inequalities that they saw as impacting women's health. They were asked to document the process by producing an informative wiki on the Sakai website. Um, each group was then asked to present a solutionary proposal um, to the class in whatever form that they thought was mo would be most effective in, in coming through with the, the solution. This creative collaboration led to a wonderful, wonderful array of final projects, all of which were small-scale expressions of engaged feminist movement building. I mean to suggest not that, that just that they were exploring feminism in the abstract, but that in their practices and solutions, students enacted intergenerational social movements as emergent possibilities. For example, with a presentation to local city council, creating petitions, planning political campaigns, building workshops and community building websites, and building political bases by contacting, literally they contacted and got involved in ongoing on the ground movements around the world. Many groups messed with the linear tempor temporality, um, registering final projects as only the starting point for moving their projects forward. So what does this suggest as the, as the promise of digital feminist ped pedagogy? My final point here. This experiment in digital creativity also bridged the generational and technological divide in the nursing profession. By way of example, a nurse recipient, a recipient of a scholarship in my course struggled to send even basic emails mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the semester. By necessity of the assignments, after 14 weeks, she not only was a predominant participant in discussions and debates, she began using the internet as a research tool and a resource to reach out to scholars and, and nurse activists in the Marshall Islands. Go ahead and show the clip. She also did the bulk of the work in building an informative, well-researched, and visually attractive wiki page, this is her site, that was highly regarded by others in the course for setting a high bar for final projects. 
She couldn't even send an email um, before this course. So with the aid of technological tools and the momentum of principled collaboration prompting students to work collectively, the impossibility of intergenerational feminist struggle fell beyond these students' radar. Instead, they taught me through unexpected alliances and purposeful inter-experiential collaboration. When technology is appropriated as a tool for forging otherwise, um, unlikely connections, right, that, that these collaborations make impossible, mm -hmm. necessary. So thank you so much for your time. Well, I mean, she posted this herself on YouTube, right, so, and she gave us permission to post it. But um, I know that uh, Pearson E. College has a little bit of looser restrictions on copyrights, but like, for example, on Sakai, you can't, like, um, necessarily burn an entire film, right, and stick the whole film up. But in terms of, if she posted this on YouTube, and then we asked her permission if we could post it, and then um, I asked her permission if we could use this in the conference, and, um, you know, we also give scholarships to our nurses, and she was one of the nurses who received a scholarship. And so it's good for, for the folks who vote on that to hear that she had a good experience. But I'm not sure if I'm comprehensively addressing your question. It does depend on the which course shell you're using. Sakai is more restrictive in terms of copyright stuff than Pearson E. College. As a pedagogue, teaching has always been part of everything that I do. Um, so I'm teaching in my sleep. I'm teaching, right? I'm, and that hasn't changed. Um, what changes, I think, is the directionality of how I prepare. So, you know, in the traditional classroom, my prep time was upfront. Um, and now there's something really wonderful about putting the materials out there, letting students kind of filter through some of their thinking about it. And then my prep time is in the back end, where I'm actually responding more directly to their concerns and, and engagement with the reading in the aftermath. Um, so I do still some of that upfront stuff, and I've got an agenda of lectures that I'll post, um, and I do post video lectures for them. Um, about just a few core ideas, but the long lectures that I used to prepare, um, I don't do as much in the upfront. I do very much responsive, um, which makes it a much more inter interactive um, form of teaching for me. I think it's the same with me. Um, there's a lot of preparation to set up the course in the front end, to set up Sakai, to think about what I want to show, how much information I'm going to post up front, um, months and months of preparation, like any new course, especially the new courses, right? Um, and then it's spread out more, I think, as Heidi just said. But there's, it's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. Just like any course, it's a lot of time. And um, the grading, everything, and then, um, yeah. I mean, thinking of this, I, can I bump in? There, the, the danger is... Um, that you get so excited about the course. So in the in traditional lecture hall, when students have questions, they go home. Yeah. Right? They, there's a, they there's go a home finite, there's home. a finite point where you're like, we're not going to talk about this anymore because you're going home. And they never yeah. stop. I get so jazzed as a pedagogue that it's like, you know, I really want to engage in this conversation right now. So it's really monitoring yourself if time is an issue, um, how much yeah. you want to put into a class. I feel like it's very, I feel like it's more labor intensive. Um, I, you know, I think that once you design the class, then it's much less labor intensive. But in terms of teaching like first time class in person versus teaching a first time class online, I think it's much more labor intensive designing it online. Um, part of what Heidi said, because of that, there's no finitude. I mean, you can just keep critically engaging and critically engaging. But also, you know, everything is written. Everything is textual. And, and as Chrissy was talking about, all of the students have to respond, you know? So you can't have the little meek ones sitting in the back of the classroom not saying anything. Or, I mean, people don't say things for lots of different reasons. Everyone's got to respond. And then you, in turn, I mean, to some degree, are obligated to respond to everyone's responses. But in our particular position, our priority is pedagogy. I mean, we do extensive research. We, we research as if we were writing an academic article or something, and then we put together um, classes. So that really gives us a lot of freedom, I think, to just really focus in and perfect these classes as much as we can. Um. 
Let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you.